Good evening. I call to order this meeting of the Coweta County Board of Education, Agenda 781. Today is November the 8th, 2022. If you'll please stand for the pledge and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you. You may be seated. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So move. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Recognitions, Dr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, I'll call on Public Information Officer Dean Jackson to bring you our core business and a special commendation that we have. Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Yes, our core business is up first, and we have uh, quite a uh, good entourage from Thomas Crossroads Elementary School, several teachers and several students bringing us a STEAM lesson. And I'm going to call on Principal Letitia Crosby to introduce. Good evening, Superintendent Horton and fellow board members. I'm Letitia Crosby, Principal of Thomas Crossroads Elementary School. In recognizing that the five-year strategic plan emphasizes and measures how Coweta County is committed to student success and empowering students for school and life, we at Thomas Crossroads Elementary School have identified the integration of STEAM lessons, science, technology, language, art, and math as a point of emphasis in our school improvement plan for the 2022-2023 school year. As part of our focus in this area, we are strategically planning rigorous, engaging, real life and relevant hands-on activities in our fifth grade classrooms. Ms. Rustic, Ms. Sheffer and Dr. Stevens, fifth grade teachers, along with Ms. Swansboro, our art teacher who is not present tonight, are here with three of their students this evening to share one example of the work that is being produced by our students to help us accomplish this goal. We recognize the importance of students being able to apply their understanding of mastered standards in fifth grade. We focused on STEAM lessons that unite to produce cohesive learning this year to meet our standards in ELA, math, science, and art. This October, we presented, we were, students were presented with a three-part STEAM lesson. The first part incorporated our ELA writing standards. In between part one and part two, the students worked with the art teacher to create stops. Part two incorporated our math and fraction standards, and part three was in our science class with constructive and destructive forces. The goal was to create a learning experience that would allow the students to demonstrate mastery of their skills and standards while connecting the lesson through STEAM and the use of Ozbots. The essential question for our lesson was, how do we implement our knowledge of narrative writing, fractions, surface features to construct a plot diagram for our Ozbots to follow? And now we are honored to present three of our students from Thomas Crossroads Elementary School, Courtney Cherry, Jocelyn Barrer, and Dominic Stevens. In our classes, we are asked to apply ourselves each day by writing our own narrative from our plot diagram, creating a visual, plot a, fraction, put a, plot a fractional path for the Ausbot, and create a bone bridge. The thing we liked most about this lesson was building the bone bridge and using the Ausbots. This activity taught us how everything we are learning is connected. Part one, the story. We use key vocabulary terms in this assignment that were ELA, math, and social studies terms. These are the key details about the town, characters, setting, and plot. 
This is the plot diagram I use to sequence out my narrative. It includes the hook, which captures your reader's attention, the rising action, which leads to the climax or problem of the story, and the falling action, which leads to the solution, which resolves the story. We had to continue the story from a clip that we watched. This is the writer's checklist I use to know what's required of me in the narrative. This is my narrative I wrote to continue the story. Part two is the plot. In part two, we used Ozbots. Ozbots are little robots that run on a line of coding. In this activity, we used Ozbots to run on a fractional path. These fractions were planned with, by using this plot diagram. Here are some images of fifth graders testing the Ozbots on their paths. In these images, you can see the Ozbot, a bone bridge we made in science, and two stops we made in art. Part, part three is the bone bridge. You have some examples of the bone bridge in front of you. We made a steam challenge out of using a bridge out of using Q-tips, pipe cleaners, clothespins, and craft sticks. The bridge had to be at least 10 inches long and hold the largest capacity of cane corn. Here's a video of fifth grade students talking about their um, bridge. All right, team, talk to me about your bone bridge. Was your bone bridge successful? Yes, it was. Okay, how do you know? Sydney, how do you know your bone bridge was successful? What was the final capacity of your bone bridge? Okay, how do you know? Because one can was there anything you feel like you could improve upon for your design? Um, I feel like I could have made it wider and like taller and more flatter and like more sturdy because it was like kind of all over the place but they did like fall over a all equal on the left and right and the center. Great. Great job, team. Okay, sounds like some good ideas for improvement. Great job. Oh. Here's a summary of the bone bridge. First, we had a plan to build our bridge, but we quickly realized it would let all of the candy corn fall through. Second, we tried several other ideas, but none of them worked. Then, in the end, well, in the end, we figured out that we could still use our first idea, but we had to modify it. It was a trial and error the entire time. This activity taught us how this subject connects to the real world through connecting our stories to a bridge being built, frac fractions building a road, Encoding a robot. Our future goals include helping to take care of our environment, helping to a better art economy, and using the skills we learned at school to guide us. Great job. Dr. Crosby, thank you. Thank you. Teachers, thank you so much for a great STEAM integrated lesson. I do have one question, though. Who ate the candy corn? I didn't let any of them eat it. <laughs> really? Wow. Wow. Awesome. Well, that's a great example of, of innovation going on at our district. Thank you very much.
For our next recognition tonight, we have a, a recognition of a commendation of uh, several individuals, East Coweta High School campus. We frequently say in our school system uh, to uh, our parents and, and to each other uh, that safety is our first priority on our campuses. That takes a whole lot of different forms. And I want to take a moment tonight to recognize a safety response in a matter that happened at East Coweta High School recently, which involved uh, the quick thinking, quick response, and in many case, cases, uh, prior training of several individuals on the East Coweta High School campus. Uh, I know East Coweta High School Principal Steve Allen is here tonight with several of his students and staff members who were involved in this matter. And as I describe this situation, I want to ask Principal Allen and uh, students and staff members to come forward and join me down here at the po podium if y'all don't uh, mind. And I also want to ask uh, Coweta School System Safety Director Ken Kessering to come down as well. Uh, just to give you an idea of what happened, on Thursday, September 22nd, after school, a group of students on the East Coweta High School campus <clears throat> were throwing a football ball around outside of a classroom uh, awaiting band practice. Student Connor Dewar was attempting to catch a pass when he ran into a window with both hands, shattering the glass, causing large amounts of damage to both of his hands and his arms. Uh, it was a freak accident uh, during a very innocent activity that led to a very serious situation. Connor's friends, Austin Fisher and Jakari Bryant, or Brant, excuse me, who uh, responded first. Seeing the severity of his injuries, the two used their own shirts to wrap up Connor's arms and stanch the bleeding. An East Coweta High School staff member used uh, their Syntegix bags to activate the school's alert system and bring help to the scene. East Coweta Assistant Principals Chad Collert, Stephanie Easterwood, Hap Hines, and Lee Heberlin uh, arrived quickly, assessed the severity of Connor's injuries. By looking at the wounds, they saw there was cause for concern that major arteries and perhaps nerves and tendons may have been injured in this accident. 911 was called. Mr. Collard replaced the wrappings on both of Connor's arms and was thus able to keep the student calm while assistance was en route. East Coweta High School athletic trainer Allison Ingram uh, was uh, able to arrive on scene as well. And at that time, a tourniquet was placed on Connor's right arm. Mr. Collard used his own belt to make a tourniquet for Connor's left arm. And as I've heard several times from the head of our uh, public health uh, uh, department, Shannon Kaplinger, nurse Shannon Kaplinger, uh, Mr. Collard placed that uh, correctly on that arm, and that is not an intuitive action. That's a trained action, and he did it very, very well. All in all, these actions stabilized Connor's injuries, saved his life, and Connor was airlifted to Grady Hospital where he was treated. Connor is well on his way to recovery. I want to call on first Coway to Schools Director uh, of Student Services and Safety, Ken Kesselring, to address the response of the individuals at the school that day. The response was perfect. And part of that training that our staffs go through every year is stop the bleed. In addition to training on CPR and diabetes response training and other emergency training, our staff is well prepared for situations like this. And it was very evident in that time what Chad and everyone else at East Coweta High School, you know, what they were able to accomplish. So our head nurse, Shannon, Nurse Shannon, and her staff have done a great job training our teachers and training their nurses to train our teachers. So. Thank you. I'd like to call on Principal Steve Allen to recognize the folks here, maybe some other folks as well. Uh, but again, uh, commend you and your staff uh, for everything. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you for letting us be here this evening. Um, just on a note, Connor uh, will be entering the NFL draft coming up this next season. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a very unfortunate accident, very, uh, very serious one. And um, I commend our staff uh, that was there. They did a, they did a tremendous job. In, in the so I wanted to go ahead and introduce the kids that were there. Um, Austin, come on over here. Austin Fisher, Jakari Brandt, Allison Ingram, who is our trainer. And then, of course, our assistant principal, Chad Kohler. If y'all would please... Uh, Give these guys a big round of applause. They did a great job. 
I would like to say to the board this, the, the badges that we have, the strategic badges. They are um, they are they are they are very awesome for um, all schools, uh, especially we we've been in situations to where um, we've had incidents happen. Maybe kids walk off from teachers. Uh, the good thing about these badges is that it gives us exact location that where the um, where the individuals are. Also, they can press the badges again if they are on a walk or a run uh, to let us know the precise. So thank you all for investing uh, in these badges, and, and it does make our schools safer, but that, that really goes a long way. But thank you. Guys, just want to say I was on the phone with Mr. Kesselring when the call came out that day, heard the, heard the alert going off. And of course, after the fact, I get more details. You guys did a great job that day of getting help for him, staying calm in that moment, uh, and, and waiting for additional help to get there. So you're good friends. And I want to introduce Connor yeah. too. Hey, Connor. <laughs> Connor's been in the lunchroom. He's had to have help over the last little bit trying to eat because he had both arms taped yeah. up when he first came back. But he's doing much better now. Yeah. Connor, I'm glad, glad you're okay. To, to Allison and Chad, um, training makes a difference. Yeah. Training takes over. Um, but you got to have competent folks on the other side of that training. And uh, you stepped in that day. You did a good job. And I have no doubt that the outcome – could have been very different if you didn't. So thank you for what you did. I, I've said this in this room before. I trust the people in this school system with my kids every day. And I don't think twice about it because I know the caliber of individuals that work in the school system. There's two examples of it right there. Um, that's the type of people that are here. So I just appreciate what you did that day. Thank you for, for getting him help. And Connor, I'm glad you're on the men, man. Glad you're on the men. Thank y'all. One more. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 11th, 2022 meeting? So Se moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Action items, group one, Dr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first action item I have for you in group one is to approve a change order proposal to adjust a retaining wall height on the Noonan High School Gymnasium, that's BP2. Approvals requested for a change order proposal to raise the wall height on a retaining wall on the gymnasium at Noonan High. Construction manager discovered that a poured in place retaining wall between the new gymnasium and the ninth grade building uh, was designed too low for the existing conditions. Structural engineers verified that the details for this wall were not shown correctly in the bid documents and the construction details of this wall would have to be revised. The additional cost for concrete reinforcing steel forming and labor is $33,696.80. The change order proposal and supporting documentation is attached. Madam Chair, I recommend approval. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent to approve a change order proposal to adjust a retaining wall height on the Newton High School gymnasium, part of bid package two, in the amount of $33,696.80. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, say I appreciate Dr. Horton taking me by, uh, along with uh, Director of Facilities, Mr. Cheek, uh, and then members of the crew, uh, kind of showing me exactly what was going on. I try to get out there once a month and tour the um, 
progress. So it's nice to see that in person and have my uh, questions answered then. So just want you to know I really appreciate that. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Next action item I have for you in group one is to approve early biweekly payroll for November 10th, 2022. If approved, the payroll will be issued on November the 10th of 2022. Uh, November 11th is Veterans Day, which is a federal holiday, and banks will be closed on the 11th. Uh, this only affects our biweekly paid staff. Uh, Madam Chair, I recommend approval. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent to approve early biweekly payroll for November 10th, 2022. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. The last action item I have for you in group one is to approve 2023-2024 and 2024-2025 school calendars. Stakeholder input was received regarding school calendar preferences for the 2023-24 and 24-25 school years. Survey included questions regarding the length of tr traditional holidays for students. I recommend approval of option one for 2023-24 and for 2024-25 school years. Copies of the recommended calendars and the stakeholder input are attached. Madam Chair, recommend approval. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent to approve option one of the calendars for 2023-24 and 2024-25. Is there a motion to approve? So, so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, Madam Chairman, I would like to just say thank you, Dr. Horton, for uh, taking all those many phone calls that I got from educators as well. Um, they did adapt the calendar. I appreciate you doing that. Uh, we did get uh, several calls from educators and teachers, and um, thank you for listening to their input. Uh, they were greatly appreciative of this adoption. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Action items group two, bids, Dr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first action item I have for you in group two is to approve a bid for upgrading security cameras at multiple locations. Approvals requested for the bid submitted by Diverse Networking Incorporated for installation of additional cameras and replacement of video management servers at multiple locations. Completion of this project will put all locations on the digital watchdog surveillance system. The existing video management equipment at these locations is no longer supported by the original vendor. The bid amount for equipment and installation by Diverse Networking is $242,000. $615.75. Uh, the bid tabulation sheet is attached. Madam Chair, I recommend approval. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent to approve a bid for upgrading security cameras at multiple locations. The bid amount is uh, $242,615.75 uh, from diverse networking. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Last action item I have for you in group two is to approve a proposal for replacement of the fire alarm system at Madras Middle School and Winston Dowdell Academy. Approvals requested for the proposal submitted by Torrance Construction Company for replacement of the fire alarm system at Madras Middle School and Winston Dowdell Academy. The existing fire alarm systems at these locations cannot be remotely monitored, and the current systems are no longer supported by the manufacturer. Torrance Construction Company submitted the high-scoring proposal with a total score of 99 points and a total bid of $672,546. The proposal scorecard and bids tabulation sheets are attached. Madam Chair, I recommend approval. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent to approve a proposal for replacement of the fire alarm system at Madras Middle School and Winston Dydell Academy. The total amount is $672,546 from Torrance Construction. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Action items group three, Dr. Horton, TRIPS. 
Call on Dr. Mark Guy to bring you trips. Dr. Guy. Thank you, Dr. Horton. The principal of East Coweta High School requests <clears throat> permission for the East Coweta Band students to participate in the 2023 Waikiki Holiday Parade in Honolulu, Hawaii, commemorating <clears throat> the 82nd anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, this will take place November 20th through the 27th, 2023. Students will miss one day of school, but there's no cost to the school system. The principal of East Coweta High School also requests permission for the boys basketball team to participate in the Sunshine State Explosion in Coconut Creek, Florida, December 28th through the 29th, 2022. Students will not miss any days of school and there's no cost to the school system. Both of these requests meet our board policy guidelines for out-of-state field trips. Board members, just a note on the East Coweta Hawaii trip. This is a trip that they have done before. Uh, they tend to do these every so often, so this is, uh, this is not a new trip for us, and there was no provision in their letter that the superintendent be allowed to go. Um, so with that, uh, I guess without that, I recommend approval. So. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent um, to approve these uh, field trip requests for East Coweta, one for the band to go to the Waikiki Holiday Parade in Honolulu, and then for the boys basketball team to go to the Sunshine State Explosion in Coconut Creek, Florida. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero. Call on Mr. Chapman to bring you budget report and sales tax. Mr. Chapman. Good afternoon. Uh, October report is presented. We've completed 33.33% of the year. We've expended 32.69% of our budget. We're under budget just over $200,000 to this point. Sales tax continue to see good numbers, just over 3.2 million. Uh, increase year over year is 14.65%. Call on Dr. Guy to bring you staff and student attendance and your board goal report. Dr. Guy. Thank you once again, Dr. Horton, for the third attendance period. Highest staff attendance was Eastside Elementary School. Highest student attendance in the program area was Maggie Brown. Highest elementary student attendance, Eastside Elementary. Highest middle school student attendance, Arnold Middle School. And the highest high school student attendance, Northgate High School, home of the Vikings. Tonight, I'd like to give you an ACT and SAT score update. Uh, for the sixth year in a row, uh, Georgia students exceeded the national average on the ACT, the American College Test. Georgia's class of 2022 recorded an average composite score of 21.6 compared to the national average of 19.8. Coweta County School System students also scored an average composite score of 21.6 on the ACT. The Georgia student average score decreased slightly compared to 2021 when the average was 22.6. However, test participation did increase sharply this past year compared to 2021 when the impacts of the pandemic, including the temporary waiver of the SAT and ACT score requirements for the University System of Georgia admissions calls fewer students in the graduating class to take the ACT. The Coweta County School System's average SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the score for, graduating class, for the graduating class of 2022 was 1070, placing participating Coweta students well above state and national averages on the college entrance exam. According to the College Board and the Georgia Department of Education, it was the fifth straight year in a row that Georgia students outscored the national average on the SAT and the eighth year that Coweta students outscored both state and national averages. The Coweta County School System's average SAT performance placed Coweta 42 points above the national average 
and 18 points above the state average. The Coweta County School System ranked in the top 16% in performance among the 182 Georgia school districts reporting average SAT scores in 2022. These scores are a strong, strong reflection of the positive work accomplished in our high schools, as well as the total school experience and the quality of work that is being done from pre-K through 12th grades in the Coweta County school system. Congratulations to all of our students, our educators, our parents, and our community. Thank you, Dr. Guy. Board members, last thing I have for you this evening is a facilities and construction report. Uh, you can see here on the report, Northgate High School, we're just closing out that project, um, installing those football lockers here uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but that project is largely closed out. Uh, Noonan High School, uh, bid package one, uh, you can see that all of the demolition is complete there. We've relocated uh, all of the underground utilities that need to be for the time being. The remaining uh, underground utilities will be completed during breaks. Uh, BP2, which is the gym, we talked a little bit about that retaining wall uh, earlier this evening. Um, backfilling of the foundation walls is proceeding, uh, and we're on track for a pretty sub significant uh, concrete pour about the middle of next week. Uh, another item of interest to you, uh, within the next couple of weeks, you should see the large construction crane uh, going in and we'll begin to, as they say, as they told me this afternoon, within a couple of weeks, we'll begin to go vertical on the Noonan High School gym uh, project. Uh, Smoky Road and CEC fire alarm replacements. Fire Marshal has completed the inspection uh, on those. State Fire Marshal completed his on Smoky Road. Um, we've got a few closeout items there that we're waiting on, but those projects are substantially complete. Uh, and then tonight, you've already heard about Madras Middle and Winston Dowdell fire alarm replacement so that we can have those updated and remotely monitored uh, and the surveillance camera upgrades uh, at various schools throughout the district. So all of those projects are underway and uh, everything is at a really good point um, at this moment in time. Madam Chair, that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Horton. At each meeting, we set aside time for public comment, and um, we are to that point now. And mm -hmm. I'd just like to read over um, the policy that we have in place regarding public participation in the board meetings. Um, each speaker will be limited to five minutes. The Board of Education will listen to each presentation without comment. After each presentation is made, each board member may respond if he or she wishes to for a period of no longer any specific county employee except through the grievance procedure set forth in the board's personnel policy. <clears throat> no one will be allowed to discuss any matter involving threatened or pending litigation with the Board of Education during the public comment portion. In the need to preserve order, no person attending the meeting will be allowed to boo, hiss, cheer, clap, or otherwise show approval or disapproval for any speaker in any manner whatsoever. No signs or placards advocating any action or position will be allowed. No personal attacks on any person will be allowed. The chairman is responsible for enforcing these rules. No citizen or system employee will be retaliated against in any manner whatsoever for speaking on matters of public concern any person not recognized within the allotted time period will be rescheduled. And finally, requests um, to speak need to be received at the Board of Education office no later than three hours prior to that particular meeting. And um, there's information on our website. Um, you can contact Ms. Nixon to get signed up if you would like. And first we have um, Ziamaro Castro, please. Good evening to all. Dr. Horton and others keep insisting that we are just trying to bring our opinions and politics into our school system. However, you want to talk about getting political? The ones that have made this board of education political are you up there. We have sat here and literally listened to campaign speeches. 
What about personal opinions? We have also sat here and listened to Ms. Dees give her personal opinions, literally stating they are in no way the reflection of the board, but her own opinions. We have witnessed the disregard by board members for the rules read before public comments. All have been allowed by the Madam Chair of this Board of Education. Besides obscenity, equity, et cetera, are things that are not defined by us. In fact, the definition of obscenity is in our state laws. They are not political. These are issues that affect our children and cross political, religious, gender, and racial boundaries. And speaking about obscenity, last month, Ms. Mink requested that Dr. Horton give us an update on the status of the books brought up to the attention of this board since last year. I have since received invitations from four schools to their media review committees. I'm pleased that Noonan High School took out the graphic novel of The Handmaid's Tale and A Court of Mist and Fury. The non-graphic novel of The Handmaid's Tale will stay, however, only for students that are 18 years of age or older, and if any younger ones, but they have to have prior parental consent. And that is fair, and that is right. Speaking about parental consent, how many parents know what books to list in the opt-out form for their kids not to read? In fact, how many of you would be able to name all of the books? I assure you that none of you would be able to name all of those books. I assure you that um, you would not even know, even knowing, like you told people and you directed them in the opt-out form to go to the Follett Destiny um, website but you don't know what you're looking for. The opt-out form was a waste of taxpayer money and a great way to cover yourselves. We need solutions. On September 2nd, I met with Dr. Horton and Dean Jackson to show them a rating system that we as an organization have the rights to use. With the help of this rating system, one school district in Texas has adopted a rating system of their own and has made it policy. A rating system that is objective, quantifiable, and nonpartisan is a good tool to screen books that may be inappropriate for children based on their age. The particular rating system we proposed utilizes standards agreed upon by the community writ large to be appropriate slash inappropriate to varying age groups. And it has the added benefit that we have already used it on over 350, 375 books, lost account right now, so you can measure and weigh its application. Of course, we understand that there are thousands of books in the schools, but we need a starting point, and this can be it. We agree that the single best rater in the decision of books for their kids is without a doubt the parent. Parents depend on rating systems for movies, TV shows, video games, why not books? I appreciate that Dr. Horton expressed to me that these conversations have taken the school system to have more robust purchasing procedures on the front end and that the media specialists are no longer on an island by themselves. And they sent out the opt-out form and informed parents of their rights and where to find the books available to their children. Nevertheless, I was also told that they were going to take the same approach they took when COVID in 2020 took a couple of weeks and saw what others were doing and crafted their plan based on that. However, while we are waiting to see what other districts do with this, we still have children being exposed to books like Tilt by Ellen Hopkins. Um, I was going to read the excerpt, but given the time, um, this book is found at Winston Dowdell Academy. We rate it a four out of five, five being the worst rating because it is a book that contains explicit sexual activities with minors. It also contains drug use, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and other things that minors shouldn't be exposed to. So I'm hoping that even though I know that I cannot, per the policy and per SB 226 into law, bring that up to you, that you will take your time to look at that book and get it out of our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alan Brady. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak once again. 
As we've been discussing works of literature that are currently present in our school libraries and elsewhere, I finally had an opportunity to read a very famous book that should be required reading in all schools. I can't believe it took me so long to get around to it. Now I know what the fuss was all about. Animal Farm is a timeless classic that has a lot to teach us about what is going on today. We know that there's been a hundred year plus year effort to impose what is basically a religion on people around the world. Classical Marxism used class division and envy to advance its purposes. That worked well in some areas of the world that have been subject to centuries of poverty and suffering and with well-defined underclasses and ruling classes, but in the West, especially our country, the miracle of the free market and the concept of natural or God-given, if you will, rights made the populace, even those currently in poverty, much more resistant to this method. Even with all the fits and starts and struggles to make sure that these rights were available to all, the people knew if they worked hard and took advantage of every opportunity, they too had a chance to rise to the top, however they might define it. This was a major impediment to the Marxist revolution in the West. By the 1960s, it became clear that a different method would have to be used. So some of the intellectuals and academics pushing the revolution looked to their past and discovered the methods of a figure from the short-lived Hungarian so Soviet Republic way back in 1919. George Lukács was the people's commissar for education and culture. Among other things, he found that an effective way to separate youth from their ties to their family and culture was through education and specifically using explicit sexual content as part of the program. The revolution did not work out so well at the time. Traditional Hungarians were appalled at this and the Hungarian Soviet Republic only lasted a few months. But 50 years later, the time was ripe to try again. The revolutionaries of the 1960s dropped their program of violent protest and terrorism and took to the halls of academia, specifically to the university departments of education. It took 50 years for their efforts to come to full fruition, but now here we are. Old George's method methods are back. Shock the kids with relentless focus on sexual content and data mine them to determine what can be used once again, separate them from their family and faith and make them change agents in the new round of the revolution. So that is why it's necessary for sexual content to be presented to kids, in many cases years before they are psychologically ready for it and against the wishes and or the knowledge of their parents. Their innocence must be stolen, their beliefs must be shaped in the service of something else. But to what end? Back to Animal Farm, spoiler alert. In one of the early chapters, it is mentioned in passing that Napoleon the pig and his cohorts take the puppies away to educate them. Later on, animals suspected of disloyalty are disposed of, and it is now the full-grown dogs, those puppies educated in secret by the ruling pigs, that carry out the executions after the offenders confess to their crimes against the revolution, of course. That is what this is all about. The revolutionaries among us need to shock troops to carry out their program of destruction. Now, it may well be true that many children, due to the love and devotion of their families and the presence of faith in their lives, or maybe just because they're naturally resistant to brainwashing, can shake this off and remain relatively unaffected. And there are clearly many adults, including teachers and other people of influence, who can help protect them from all this. But some are not able to resist. And it certainly doesn't help when other adults refuse to see or act on the problem, or worse, actively participate in promoting it, whether they realize the full implications or not. Ladies and gentlemen, some of us have been, have been presenting these problems to you for quite a while now and have repeatedly urged you to take action to stop the destruction. So far, little has happened, although I do hear that maybe that's changing. In fact, it has been made harder to formally object, that is true. But the word is getting out. Despite what may have happened here and elsewhere in Georgia earlier this year, millions of people are making their opinions known at the ballot box today, and changes will be made. And like everything else going on these days, those waves will eventually lap onto the shores of Coweta County. Meanwhile, I urge you once again, pick a side. There are only two. Make a choice. And in the words of Joshua, as the Israelites were about to enter the Promised Land, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Next we have Jasmine Meehan.
Good evening. Um, thank you again for allowing me to speak here each month. Um, I truly pray that parents are starting to pay attention and listening to what I and others have been trying to share. Um, I would not expect you all to know each and every book that is within every school media center. Um, I would, however, have expected that once it was brought to your attention that there are, in fact, materials containing explicit material or explicit topics, um, including pedophilia in some cases, um, showing in your database as access accessible to our children, you all would have been gung-ho to take action and show the community that you will not allow the corruption of our children to take place. Um, I may be repeating myself a bit, but it is extremely disappointing that you as our elected officials have brushed it off so casually and then accused the very people of bringing this information to light of being political activists or of having an agenda to disrupt the status quo, as you will, while ignoring the fact that we are citizens of the community uh, that you represent, some of us parents to young children who have been a part of the county. Um, there was one mem board member that understood this issue at hand, and sadly her time has come to an end. Um, it was refreshing to know that there was one voice up there that was not afraid to stand out from the rest, go against the current, and ask questions and not simply be a yes ma'am kind of person. Uh, fact of the matter is there are many books in our media centers that just do not belong there. Um, and what reality is having a book containing references to pedophilia okay with any of you? Why aren't you all angry that this has been allowed to occur? Uh, why do you sit stone-faced each month while people of the community come here to speak out? Where's your moral fiber as Mr. Robertson has discussed months ago? Um, there will be a judgment day, and I do pray for all of you as that day approaches. Um, I do not come here for any other reason than to bring attention to things that are concerning. One would hope that as elected officials, you would take heed and investigate these matters of concern. Um, I recently saw an anonymous post on Facebook that a parent shared of a political survey that was given out to a class of fourth graders here in Coweta County. Um, I also have a fourth grader. He is nine. He would not understand half of what was on that survey including a question of whether women should be allowed to have abortions if they choose. Now, why would a child need to even know what an abortion is? What nine-year-old knows about welfare? And why is that something that they should concern themselves with? Um, there was a pretty big discussion on this Facebook post, and there was a very uneven mix of people who are okay with it and some that think that it's okay, um, or people that don't believe it's, or believe it's too early, I'm sorry, to involve children in these topics. Our community seems quite broken. Um, and this is exactly what I have been speaking on. We're trying to turn our young children into little adults. We're putting too much on them that they simply cannot comprehend. Why can we not let kids just be kids? Um, why can't school simply be about learning the fundamentals of math, reading, and writing? And why now do we have this huge investment into mental health? Um, the amount of money that we are investing into that is extremely concerning. Uh, that is a whole other beast that I have also spoken on. And if you're, not, if you're not aware of what the whole child framework and learning 2025 is, I suggest you get to researching. Um, three superintendents from Georgia attended the Learning 2025 co conference this past June. And the Chatham County superintendent is even on the board of learning of 2025. Um, these are non-governmental agencies attempting to insert themselves into our educational system, and they do it through funding. Just to share, some of the key players investing in these programs are the School Superintendents Association, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, the CDC, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. If those names do not send a shiver down your spine, then you have no idea what is going on in the world today. No one elected these people to make these decisions for us. They've assumed their elitist status to allow them to do whatever they want. Third, these third party organizations are focusing on SEL as opposed to academics and are targeting our children under the guise of diversity and inclusion. They're using data mining to gather our information and project what our social credit score should be. That is coming if we do not object. Superintendent Horton and board members, I urge you to reject these ideas when they are presented to our county. They will be presented at some point, and I'm assuming they're going to come in a package deal with some funding. Um, if you truly want what is best for our community and our children, um, I recommend that you be ahead of this and you understand the dangers that it presents. 
I thank you all for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I would like my one minute to speak. I did see that post today that was circulating on Caddy Women, I believe it was, and it was said that a survey was given to elementary children. It was posted anonymously. Um, I did call and bring it to Dr. Horton's attention. It did not say it was a Coweta County school. It did not say that. It did not state who it was or what district it was in, but we were aware of that. I made Dr. Horton immediately aware of it, and he didn't know anything about it, and it never stated, it was anonymous, it never stated it was Coweta County School. And I do believe, Ms. Dees, that they also said that it was brought to the school administration's attention. They had no idea about it, and it was addressed immediately? That is correct. Without a school name or a parent name, correct? That is correct. Thanks. All right, thank you. Are there any board comments? All right, um, is there a motion to approve to enter into executive session to discuss personnel, real estate, and potential litigation? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five to zero.